church if you notice all the pastors are in the front row and uh, yeah no it's 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 not because they're better okay we have a growing problem here at Mountain Bible Church and it and it is uh, a good one because we are growing this service is actually a little lighter than the second service but we've got a full uh, full church which is a fun thing to have and so the pastors are moving forward to take that step and show we hate the front row okay we do Everyone does. It's always empty, uh, but we, we're making room so that more people can fit in. Uh, this service, I'm, I'm not going to tell you you have to scoot in, but if you've got room between you, make room for guests if you can. And then next service, if you guys come to second, it'll be more important as well. But turn to somebody next to you, shake a hand, and tell them welcome to Mountain Bible this morning.
Well, good morning. You didn't know if you sat in the front row you were a pastor, huh? Uh, you just never know. You never know. Well, welcome. Um, we have some welcome cards in the chair in front of you. If you're new, we'd love for you to fill that out and put it in the offering box on the back wall of the church. It's our way of connecting with you, and if you have a question or a prayer request, you can put that on the card and we'd be glad to get back to you. Um, I was reading in Colossians this morning, and uh, Paul said one of his goals of the church was to present every man complete or mature in Christ. And uh, we have some ways that uh, we want to do that here at Mountain Bible in the coming uh, week. We have a lot of things starting up to present to you complete in Christ. And uh, on Wednesday night, we begin our kickoff. Uh, for family fuel for young families to come starting at 6 o'clock and there's children's ministry at 6 o'clock to 7.30 and uh, middle school meets also on that night from 6.30 to 8 so you can come and bring your family and also Dennis Perch starts his Bible study that night right here on the campus as well so uh, that's all starting Wednesday night so make sure you come and be a part of that and then we have some men's small groups starting up. Uh, my, uh, my device here says uh, it's on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Sundays, and they're men's small groups to discuss the sermons. And uh, you can sign up for those online, men, if you're not already in one of those. And then our foundations class is beginning. Dan and Cindy Corbin are going to be starting that um, on uh it's next, or, or it's on the uh, 15th, is that right? Next Sunday. Okay, next Sunday, if you would like to sign up for Biblical Foundations, you can do that. It's an 11-week course to give you foundational truth of our faith, and so you can take part of that. And then lastly, if you'd like to be uh, a member of Mountain Bible, we have a membership class coming up on September 15th from 3 to 5 in the Ramada. You can sign up for that with one of those welcome cards or just call the church office and say, I'd like to go to the membership class and we would love to have you come. With all of that, to present you complete in Christ, let's pray. Father God, I thank you that we can come together and worship this morning, that uh, we can just put all the, the things in the world that are in our minds aside and just worship you from our hearts and from our spirits and God I pray you would receive our worship help us to respond to the word of God in a way that's pleasing to you in your name amen all right let's stand and worship together
has to retreat Just one touch I feel the presence of heaven Just one touch My eyes were open to see My heart can't help but believe it There's nothing that our God can do There's not a mountain that He can
power like the power of Jesus. Their faith rocks, they'll all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Their faith rocks, they'll all agree. There's no power like his power. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain that he can move. Oh, praise the name. Makes a way. There's nothing that our God can do. Oh, no, there's nothing that our God can do. There's not a prison wall he can't break through. Oh, praise the name. thank you. God, we can put our trust in you. And we know that you are coming again. And God, today as we are sitting in, in your presence, Lord, that we pray that your word would be mighty in this place, that you would speak directly to us. Use Billy, Lord, we ask in your mighty name. Amen. Well, good morning. Good to see you guys. Great to worship together as always. What a blessing. Hey, uh, I just want to encourage, just as, as Pastor Craig did, if you're not connected here, if you're not plugged in, if, if Sunday morning is your only sort of touch point with Mountain Bible, um, take advantage of these opportunities that are starting this next week. We've got Family Fuel. We've got the other, the other adult Bible study on Wednesday nights. We've got the men's studies. We've got the Biblical Foundations class. There's lots of ways to get plugged in. The ladies' Bible studies are happening as well. So... Um, don't just let this be a place where you just kind of come and go Sunday morning and you don't make real connections. Um, it'll be a much richer experience if you will plug in, just dive in, take that step of faith, and, uh, and just show up. At least give it a shot, right? Give it a try once, twice maybe. Um, I, and on that note, I will say, as far as Family Fuel goes, uh, I recognize that parents of little bitty ones, we kind of push past bedtime often. And so it's tough for the, those that have little biddies to come because they start melting down around 7 o'clock and we don't end until 7.30. But what I would say is just show up the first night and then you can kind of get the phone numbers of other families in the same kind of uh, season of life. And so even if you can't keep making it, you will have made some of those connections. So just show up the first night. I'll just say that. So give it one shot, everybody. Well, we are in our fifth week of our study through Romans chapter 8. Our fifth week. So you can turn there, Romans 8. We're still there. We're going to remain here one more week after this morning because it's just that good. We just need to, to kind of slow down and just kind of sit in this passage and allow the Spirit to minister to us these unbelievable truths, these mind-blowing truths that He's been giving to us, and there are so many. I would encourage you, probably should have encouraged you this earlier, but I'll encourage you, and I'm going to do the same, read the entirety of chapter 8 every day for this next week. The entirety of, entirety of chapter 8 every day for this next week. Just let these truths just sink in, take them in. They're, they're truly uh, too good to be true, and yet they are. They are true. So we're going to dive right in, verses 26 and 27 of Romans 8 this morning. Likewise, and we'll explain a little bit of where the likewise comes from, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according 
to the will of God. So we've been talking about those things that the Spirit of God enables us to do. He enables us to mortify the deeds of the flesh or put to death the deeds of the flesh. By the Spirit, we've received uh, uh, the sense of adoption, the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father, this relationship, intimate relationship with our God. And now by the Spirit, we're, we're being told that he helps in our, our, all of our weaknesses, specifically here as mentioned, the, the weakness when it comes to prayer. And I love this because the reality is I, I don't know a Christian who feels like they've arrived in the area of prayer. Raise your hand if you've arrived in the area of prayer. If you just got it dialed in, figured out. Okay, good. If you raise your hand, I, I, didn't, I wouldn't know what to do with that. So <laughs> the truth is, we, we all wrestle with, at least from time to time, this sort of feeling that, man, I should pray more. I should pray better, more effectively. Um, I, I, should, I, should, uh, I should labor in this, in this thing that God has called us to and gifted us with more, more faithfully. And I think sometimes the, the reality is we just don't even know what to pray or how to pray for specific things. There are those moments in our lives when we just kind of go, I, I don't even know what to pray for or how to pray in this particular situation. We're told here the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now, many have interpreted this as referring to the gift of tongues. You may or may not be familiar with that. 1 Corinthians 14 explains to us the gift of tongues, that God gifts some individuals within the body of Christ a spiritual language where they can communicate with God. They might not even understand what it is that they're communicating, but the Spirit knows. The Spirit bears witness. And so those individuals can exercise this prayer language in such a way that they're communing with God from, from spirit to spirit. It's, it's something that bypasses our understanding. And so it's just this personal communion with the Lord. I don't think this is speaking to that exclusively, but I certainly believe that the gift of tongues would be included in this spirit giving utterance uh, or, or through the groanings that we don't even understand. But for those of us who don't have that gift, I'm one of those, that doesn't mean that we're out of luck. Because sometimes you find yourself in a situation where, where truly all you can do is groan. All you can do is just kind of go, oh, Lord, I don't even know. You're just kind of, oh, I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I'm, sometimes all we can do is kind of moan and make noises because we're just that overwhelmed or that impacted by the moment or whatever the case is. And we're told here that in those times, the Spirit steps in and is interceding on our behalf. And of course, he's praying in the will of God because he has the same mind as the Father, the same heart as the Father. I love that. That's, that's, a, that's a huge comfort to me because there are those times when I just don't know how to pray or what to pray. And I think in those moments, we can just kind of be quiet before the Lord and just kind of ask the Lord, Lord, would you just, would you intercede in this situation on my behalf? I don't have the words in this moment. There was one, one moment in particular where I, I just felt the Spirit interceding on my behalf. There have been many but maybe it was the first time that I really experienced this in a profound way. Some friends of ours were getting married. They were getting married in the uh, backyard of the bride's family home. They lived out of town quite a ways, and they had a beautiful property. And it was a large wedding. There were, there were people being shuttled in. They had to park off-site a little ways, about a mile and a half down the road. And uh, they were being shuttled onto the property. And uh, it was a beautiful day in July. As people are arriving, they're being shuttled in. The, the wedding party is taking photographs in another part of the property. And, and uh, everyone's there and, of course, dressed 
beautifully and and um, my wife and I are over with them they're close friends of ours we're over there just 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 enjoying the moment and the groom's dad was a bit of a gruff guy uh, sort of a gruff guy kind of a goofball in some ways just kind of regularly making uh, sort of irreverent comments or offhanded comments uh, in the moment you know and he's got his tuxedo on and and uh, and someone says to him they say wow you look pretty good in that thing and uh, he said well get a good look at it because the next time you see me in one of these will be at my funeral and they kind of laughed you know because that's just kind of who he was well in that moment he hit the ground and his buddy thought he was messing around and said hey you're messing up your suit you know go get, get up get up he had a massive heart attack in that moment and he died right then we're standing there and all of us are just shocked we're just dumbfounded we don't have any idea what to do in that moment everyone's been shuttled onto the property they're all seated in the seats ready to go the minister is there who was my pastor at the time I was a youth pastor at the time uh, ready to go to officiate the wedding to get everybody back off the property is a pretty big process at that point in time. Right as this has taken place, it was the wildest thing. The sky just kind of went dark. I mean, clouds rolled in, a storm rolled in, which was not common for that part of, uh, of the country. And, and uh, this wind kicked up, and it was just the weirdest, most surreal moment. And so my wife and I and our pastor grabbed hands, and we just stood there, and we just kind of moaned. We just kind of groaned. We had no idea what to pray. We just didn't know, should the wedding continue? Should the wedding not continue? What, what do we do in this moment? And so we're just kind of standing there. And I remember we, 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 the three of us just sort of cried and just sort of groaned. And I, I just felt the Spirit interceding on our behalf in that moment i just felt the spirit was was moving in that moment through our groanings it's exactly as we see here in the scriptures they did go ahead and get married by the way and uh and it was a beautiful wedding it was a, a very bittersweet moment and a very bittersweet day but but the lord was there even in that even in that turmoil even in that heartbreak the lord was there and the Spirit was moving even through our groanings. It's so comforting to know that when we're just confused and we don't know what's going on and we don't know how to communicate what's, what's happening in our hearts, that the Spirit will step in and, and take over and move on our behalf, isn't it? That's what we're being told here, that, that, that when we are, are weak, when we are lacking He's there to make up that lack. He's there to pick up the slack and to move on our behalf. Look at verse 28. If this one isn't underlined, I think you need to get out a pencil. And we know that all things work together for the good, for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. That's an insane truth. That's an incredible truth. This is one of the best promises in the Bible. For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purposes. We experience so many painful things, confusing things bewildering moments, things that we, have, we, we just can't wrap our minds around, we just don't understand, terrible things in life at times, and they, they, they just feel like there's no way anything good could possibly come from this. There, there's just no redemption here. In the moment, it just feels that way. There can't be any redemption of this. This is just horrible. This is just heartbreaking this is there's no there's no silver lining in this moment but this verse tells us that somehow because we belong to him 
God will work it out for our good. Somehow, some way, in some timing. And I know we just read it, and I know that you've most likely heard it, but let's just answer the question. Which things? All things. Right? All things. That's hard to believe, especially in those moments. It's hard to believe, truly, all things. But all means all in the Greek, just like it does in English. All things. Whatever it is you're going through this morning, whether it's financial crisis, whether it's health crisis, whether it's broken relationships, Whatever the case is, whatever it may be, if you are a child of God, if you have chosen to, be, to place faith in Jesus Christ, then you have this promise that all of it is going to somehow be worked out for your good and for his glory. That's an amazing thing. That's a mind-blowing thing. And this promise changes the way we experience hardship and suffering, doesn't it? It should. It changes the way we experience those things. If there was no sovereign God, a God who was in control, who, was, who, who loved me, then my pain and my suffering would just be that, empty and without purpose and just, just harmful to me. But with this truth, and so many others in the scriptures, we know that though it may be painful and gut-wrenching and, and, and a horrible thing that's taking place, there's hope in it. There's hope in the midst of it. At some point, in some way, I will see good from what I've endured. What a testament to God's amazing sovereignty. Amazing. I see this every week in our congregation. I see this hope every week in our congregation. This week, we've lost another one of our beloved church members. Marie Mayer went to be with the Lord. And once again, we've seen a spouse who's enduring heartache and heartbreak, choosing to come and honor Christ, choosing to gather with the body of Christ and worship together. We've seen this over and over and over again. Now, if you need to take a week or two in your heartbreak, there's no shame in that whatsoever. But I'm just, I, I'm just continually amazed as I watch these saints that have experienced heartache of, of all kinds, Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, choosing to enter into the house of the Lord and worship the Lord. It just, it's amazing. This morning, the first thing that, I, that came to mind for me was, these people are relentless. In the best possible way. These people are relentless. Nothing deters them. Nothing stops them. They just continue to, to worship the Lord. They continue to trust the Lord. They just continue to come to the Lord. Why? Because of the hope. Because we believe. We believe that the hope is real. We believe that he will bring good somehow, some way, out of even the most heart-wrenching things. It's incredible. Amazing. Even injustice, even those things that are outside of his will for your life. Now, the fact that he will bring good doesn't mean that he ever ordains evil. There are those things that we experience that happen to us or that are done to us that are outside of his desire, his will for you. But he'll still bring good even out of those things. Even out of those things. We see this in the life of Joseph, don't we? So it was God's plan that Joseph delivered his people from Egypt. But somehow, and so he was going to get Joseph to Egypt. 
he did not ordain the evil that Joseph's brothers did to him by selling him into slavery. But he knew that they were going to do that, and he already had a plan for good to come from it. That's how our sovereign God works. Man has will. Man has free will. Man can do horrible atrocities to one another. We can do those things, and unfortunately we do. And yet, in God's sovereignty, he's able to bring good out of those things. And so we, we need to trust that. We need to lean into that. God used what Joseph's brothers did to him to preserve an entire nation. And Joseph trusted the Lord every step of the way, all the way through, even when he had been the best slave he could possibly be, right? And he was elevated in his master's house as a result of his faithfulness. And then he was falsely accused and he experienced another horrible injustice, was thrown into prison. Even there, he didn't despair. He chose to continue to trust the Lord and be a servant of God. And God was able to use him, and God brought incredible good from the, the pain that he had experienced. That's what this verse is promising to us. And it's an incredible verse, and I would encourage you to underline that thing. Give it, give it multiple, give it a bold underlining, right? This is a verse that I go to over and over and over. Whenever I don't understand, whenever I don't get it, I go to this verse. Okay, Lord, you've promised all things. Somehow, all things are going to work together for my good. Now let's look at verses 29 and 30. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That is, Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. And now we come after him. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. And so these verses are explaining to us what it means to be one who has been called according to his purpose. And why God continues to work all of our experiences together for our good. In Ephesians 1.4, it says he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Why? Because of his love for you. He chose you to be his, to walk with him before the foundation of the world because of his love for you. We'll look at the more theological implications, the more maybe doctrinal implications of predestination and election in the next chapter. But the reason for these verses in the context of this passage is clearly to strengthen and encourage believers who are experiencing hardship. The Lord is saying these things to us. I have predestined you. I have chosen you. I have elected you before the foundations of the world because he wants to encourage you when you're suffering, when you're struggling, when you're experiencing hardship. He wants to strengthen you. Paul is assuring us that God will not abandon us, that when we suffer, it's not because he's forgotten about us, but he's the author of our salvation from the beginning to the end. Philippians 1 6 says, For I am confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it into the day of Christ Jesus. He's telling us here that whatever it is that's happening in your life, whatever it is that's going on, it may feel like the wheels are coming off, but they're not because he's going to hold them on. He's the one that put those wheels in motion. He's the one that got you started. He's the one that called you in. And he's the one that's going to keep it together. That's what he's telling us here. And what has he predestined us for specifically? Look at verse 29 again. To be conformed into the image of his son. 
That's what we're predestined for, to be conformed into the image of his son. I don't know about you, but there are days that that's extremely encouraging for me. Because there are days where I, I start to go, have I grown in my faith at all in the last five years, in the last 10 years? Am I growing? I mean, I, I'll, I'll stumble in such a way or, or I'll, I'll sin in such a way that I just go, oh my goodness, I, what? Am I growing at all? Am I, am I moving forward? Am I advancing in my faith and in my, in my Christian maturity? And then I remember, he's the one that started it, and he's going to be faithful to finish it, and I have been predestined by God, meaning it's going to happen. It's absolutely going to happen. I have been predestined by God to be conformed in the image of his son. I'm going to become like Jesus. That's just a fact. I am going to become like Jesus. And so maybe, maybe you're one that's wondered and, and, and questioned, am I even saved? Am I even a Christian? I, have I, am I doing enough? I, I just, I'm not sure. Well, because of this verse and so many others, you can know that he's called you He's predestined you. He's, he's brought you into salvation, and he will be the one that is, that is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. I love that. I love that truth, that I, I am on that track. Now, of course, I think we, we play a role in the timeline of our, of our conforming to Jesus, right? Like, I, I can choose whether or not to submit to the process of sanctification and submit myself to the process of becoming more like Jesus, or I can be stubborn, and I can be, I can be fleshly, and I can be carnally minded at times, and I can greatly slow that process here on earth. But even if I choose that, if I've truly placed faith in Jesus... I'm going to become like him on the other side of this life in eternity. I'll be made like him. The sin will be removed. The stubbornness, the pride, the arrogance will all be removed. I will be like Jesus, not, not in divinity, not God, but I'm going to be conformed into his image. I'm going to look more like him. I'm going to act more like him. I'm going to think more like him. I'm going to talk more like him. I love that. Because there, it's easy. If I, if I focus on myself, it's easy for me to get down on myself and just go, oh, I don't know. I'm, I, I, you know, I'm just an embarrassment. And I just, I, I should be further along than this. And, and you know, it, it's depressing if I focus on myself. But it's so encouraging just to say, you know what, Lord? Your word says you started it, and your word says you're going to finish it. And so I'm, I'm in the process. I'm, I'm going to stick in the process. I love what Jude, verses 24 and 25 say. <clears throat> Jude is that tiny little one-chapter book right before Revelation. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Notice that first sentence again. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory. Who's doing the work? Him. He's the one. And then similarly, 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24 of 1 Thessalonians 5. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. It's his work. Now again, we, we play a role in the, in the, the timeline of our being conformed. 
Yes, absolutely, I, I, I can choose to be conformed. I can choose to submit myself to this, this process and it will, it will go faster and I will look more and more like Jesus before I die. But ultimately, it's his work. Ultimately, it's him who's doing it. We don't have to strive. We don't have to strain. We don't have to stress. We don't have to, have to kind of muster up as much strength as we possibly can in, in, our, in and of ourselves. We lean into the Spirit of God. We, we trust in the Spirit of God. We, we submit ourselves and say, Lord, I just, I lay myself at your feet. Without you, I'm nothing. You do in me what I can't do for myself. We just, we just grab hold of him. We just fix our eyes on him and he will bring us forward. And so if you find yourself groaning and suffering today, remember, <clears throat> heaven awaits you and it will blow away anything this life has to offer. We, we can't even imagine what's ahead of us. The, the, the analogy that, that works best for me when it comes to trying to understand the difference between this life and eternity is the analogy of a baby in his or her mother's womb before they're born. So a baby in its mother's womb before being birthed can hear, can feel, can imagine, the, the, the brain is working, the brain is functioning, there, there's, there's sensation, there's experience, there's, there's warmth, they can feel being pushed and jostled, they can feel, feel and hear music, there, there's, there's all sorts of, of experiences in that, that nine months. And that's life for them. That's life for, for nine months. The womb is the world. The womb is all they know. There's no way they could fathom what was on the outside of that, of that world for them. There's no way. They have little inklings, right? They have, they're hearing things, so they know, like, there's something else out there. You know, there's more out there. Things are happening out there. I just can't fully picture what, they're, what they look like and, and all that. There's no way they could fathom what was, what's on the other side. And that's, that's us now. We think we're experiencing so much and we're seeing so much and we're hearing so much and we're feeling so much and we're, this is the world, this is everything. But there's little inklings about what might be on the other side, right? We, we hear our Father's voice, sort of, sort of still small voice, obscured by other things. We, we know that there's eternity. The, the scriptures tell us, Ecclesiastes, that God has placed eternity in the hearts of man. We know there's more, but we don't know what it looks like, and we can't quite wrap our minds around it but it's gonna blow this experience away. It's gonna blow this experience out of the water. That's what's ahead of us. And so if you're suffering today, if you're dealing with heartbreak today and hardship today, know that the present sufferings can't even be compared with the, with the glory that will be revealed. It just, there's no comparison. Remember that the Holy Spirit is with you, leading you in prayer, interceding on your behalf. Remember that you've been chosen by God and that he has a plan for your life and that he will work out all things together for your good and for his glory. Remember that Jesus suffered and died on your behalf so that all of these truths, all of these promises can be yours today. Now, if you're with us this morning, you haven't placed faith in Jesus yet. You haven't, your eyes haven't been opened. You haven't fully been convinced that, that I need a savior. I, I think maybe I can still handle this thing called life on my own. 
I'm not sure I need this crutch of religion. And the Lord is speaking to you now, and the Lord is saying, come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for your soul. The Lord is convicting you of your sin, drawing you to himself. Man, you need to respond to him. Because the promises that we've talked about this morning and the promises we've studied throughout this chapter are not yours yet until you are in Christ. Until you have placed faith in Jesus and what he did on the cross for you. The promise of heaven is not yours yet. The promise of all things is not yours yet. But it can be. And the Lord wants it to be. And so do not miss the opportunity to place your faith in Jesus and be the recipient of all of the promises contained in God's word. And there are so, so many. Amen? Lord, we thank you. And we praise you, God, that your promises to us, your, the things that you have said to us through your word, they just seem too good to be true. And yet, they are. They are true. We testify to it. Those who are suffering, who have joy in any way, those who are hurting, who have peace in the face of that hurt, those who are struggling and bewildered, who, who have hope, are evidence of the, the reality of your promises in our lives. And God, I just pray that for everyone in this room, who might be facing something confusing, something they can't wrap their minds around, that, Lord, the promises of your word this morning would would brighten their countenance, would, would breathe fresh wind into their sails, and encourage their hearts to keep moving forward with hope. And, Lord, I ask, we ask together today, if there's anybody in this room that has not yet bowed their heads, their hearts, and bent their knees before you, Jesus, acknowledging that you have done what they could not do, that you have saved them through your death and resurrection, and believing that you are their Messiah, their Savior. God, would you do that work in each and every heart this morning? Maybe they're in the Ramada this morning. Maybe they're going to be listening on YouTube or Facebook later. Lord, would you speak to them, God? And Lord, would they respond to you in faith? We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to take communion together this morning. So uh, during this next song, as the worship team leads us, you'll come forward, receive the elements. It's a double cup, so the, the little excuse for a piece of bread is in the bottom and uh, the juice is in the top. Take both cups back to your seat with you and uh, we'll take it all together once everyone has come and received. We'll kind of keep some sort of order. We've tried to give directions. We're not doing that anymore. So just kind of come, you know, fairly orderly in some fashion during this next song, okay? Let's worship the Lord. Jesus. 
As the Apostle Paul gave the uh, instructions to the Corinthian church about how to take communion or how to partake in the Lord's Supper, he said, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. And so what we're doing here this morning, the church has been doing for two millennia. For 2,000 years across the globe, every era, every culture, every ethnicity, every language has been doing exactly what we're doing in, with slight variations throughout the millennia. I love that idea that we're, we're part of this body of Christ. It's not just here at Mountain Bible or here in Payson or here in Arizona or here in the United States, but around the world and throughout time. We're part of the body of Christ. And this is something he's given us to partake of. And so the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. You can take the bread in your hands. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which was broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, we hold this bread in our hands. We do this in remembrance of what you did for us on the cross. The pain that you bore, the blood that was shed, the bruises, all of it, Lord, the stripes in your back, the blows to your face. We hold this bread and remember you did all of this for us. You did all of this because of your love for us. You did not turn away. You did not shield yourself. You did not try to protect yourself from the pain, but you took it for us. And so we take this bread in remembrance of what you've done for us. Let's go ahead and take the bread. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so Jesus, we hold this cup in remembrance of you. Without your blood that was shed, we are hopeless. We are lost in our sin. But because of what you did on the cross for us, we are redeemed. We are justified. We are forgiven. Glory awaits us. And so we hold this cup and we take this cup in faith and in remembrance and in thanksgiving. Let's take the cup. We honor you, Lord, this morning. We praise you, God, today. And so we do this to proclaim your, your death until you return. And we praise these in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and lift our voices to him one more time.
to look forward to that day where either we join you or you come and return to us, God. We look forward to it so much. We pray, Lord, that as we leave this place, like seeing through a, a veil, even still, uh, God, we ask that you would open our eyes to see people the way that you see them. God, we would give them the grace and, and love that you have given to us, God. Let us uh, share your gospel with those around us, we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You guys have a wonderful week. We'll see you back next time.